Hi, I'm Todd Gagne. I'm the co-founder of Wildfire Labs, a software accelerator based in Rapid City, South Dakota. Today, we're talking with Jake Jorinstead. Uh, Jake uh, is the CEO of a company called Bushel. Uh, Bushel is a software platform for the ag industry that specializes in helping retailers and farmers streamline their business. Uh, today, we kind of go through a pretty interesting story about him kind of struggling through college to building his own kind of consulting firm and then pivoting kind of the one-time revenue into his current business today. Uh, he has a lot of good insights and kind of nuggets um, that helped him get to and grow his business to about 175 people and $19 million in revenue. So sit back and enjoy this conversation with Jake. Thank you. All right. Well, good morning, Jake. I'm excited to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to dive in with you. Good. Well, good. Well, I'm, uh, I think you've got a lot of interesting background for us to talk through today. So uh, why don't we kind of jump into it? Um, uh, you know, as we were talking about, you know, maybe give us a little bit about background on just kind of what Bushel is and kind of your role and kind of how long you've been doing it. Yeah. So uh, my name is Jake Jornstead. I am co-founder and CEO here at a company called Bushel. Uh, we didn't start as Bushel, but uh, today what we do is uh, uh, software for the agriculture industry and more specifically grain and oil seeds and commodities around the U.S. and Canada. So think about your corn and soybeans, crops, barley, rice, kind of a whole variety of things. There's a ton of crops we support, but what we do is we help those companies who buy from the farmer the crops. So think about a co-op, an elevator, a retailer that maybe sells inputs to the farmer, seed chemical fertilizer. Those are our customers. And we built uh, how we went to market initially was we built a tool set that serves them as a customer portal. So think about, you know, your banking app where you finally can tr do transactions and see your, your checking account balance or make a deposit. But doing that for the farmer and their facility and all the business that they do throughout the year, because they're delivering grain, they're contracting grain, they're selling grain, they're um, getting paid, they're also going out and uh, buying inputs. That's the tool set we started with. So that's a little bit about what we're doing here at Bushel. We have about uh, 200 and, um, 230, 240 customers representing about 2,600 locations in the U.S. and Canada and something north of 100,000 farms that use our tools on a monthly basis around the U.S. and Canada. So pretty proud of the progress we're making and uh, we're our headquartered here in Fargo, North Dakota. Well, that's exciting. Well, good. That's a pretty good overview. Uh, before we get into your entrepreneurial journey, I'm kind of curious on just, um, you know, technology adoption. This is not a group that generally has accepted or been on the leading edge of technology. And so maybe talk a little bit about just like engagement on that same point. Is that been difficult to, to really get people to look at these or they see the value so strongly that basically they kind of say, hey, look, I've got, you know, the world's evolving and changing. I've got to kind of evolve with the times. So we have a bit of a thesis at Bushel, which is in agriculture, and although uh, in every major study and every major industry in the US, in the world, uh, agriculture is dead last in terms of digitization and adoption of these technologies. But in reality, our thesis is the, that the farmer is not the problem. The farmer has the most advanced machinery probably of any industry in some respects. I mean, the machine's driving itself Mm -hmm. uh, the combine is, and the tractors are more and more, and I mean that they've got three or four different screens on. It looks like you're getting into some form of a spaceship <laughs> when you get in these things, and that's not the problem. Um, and and honestly, the farmer uses three or four weather apps, and they use their five different tools. They're watching the markets. You know, they might be using a tool from us. That's that's pretty normal. The problem exists at the facility and the commercial level, where these companies have. These old technologies and these ERP systems that are not super functional, and you know, a lot of times guys are getting to guys or gals are getting to retirement. You know, 60, 65 years old. Um, you know, they may have their successor, they may not, um, but they don't certainly don't want to make a bunch of change before they retire. And uh, that's a common story across all of the Midwest, especially, uh, but more broadly in the egg industry. And that's where the resistance has been. And so. You know, we've heard things like, well, we don't think farmers really are, are, are really adopting this e-sign thing. And I said, okay, well, what are you, what are you doing for e-sign? Well, we don't really offer e-sign. It's like, well, the, where, what, what kind of logic are we talking about here? Because, you know, we're seeing 
farmers 90% adoption of this e-sign when it's available to them. That's just what they want to do, right? Yep. And they're getting the applications. We've got 100,000 monthly active users. That's proof in the pudding. So that's our thesis on adoption. The farmer is not the problem. Yeah, okay, that's, a, that's good. Well, why don't we kind of move from uh, kind of what you're doing today to how you got there? Um, obviously, you didn't just wake up one morning and say, we're going to start Bushel and, and off and running. I'm sure it was kind of a nonlinear process like a lot of us uh, going through the entrepreneurial journey. So maybe talk to me a little bit about your origin story. Yeah, so 12-year overnight success story. So <laughs> that's where it is. Yeah. So 2008, I went off to North Dakota State University, go Bison and a computer engineering degree, absolutely miserable um, at school. Like I, I got my overall four and a half year of computer engineering was a, a 2.7 GPA. So that nice. means I got E's and C's and some you A's. You got through. Well, I got, I got through C's and D's, got me the degree. But um, in the process, about two years into school, really even my freshman year, I was exploring ideas, I would call it. Like I was, I worked on a project uh, on the side, that was part of a scholar team, which I didn't qualify for being a scholar, but certainly was allowed to be in this group. And we were trying to design um, a rotary engine that would run on hydrogen because we thought hydrogen could be the future of these ideas. We had, I was involved in a lot of things like that. But by my sophomore year, um, I had realized that I really enjoyed software. I took a C++ class and then a Java class, and uh, I was pretty hooked on what the possibilities of software were. were and then also, if you remember in 2010, 2011, the technology world was changing rapidly. The iPhone was out. Android was launching on Verizon. In my world, that was a big deal because that's the only service that we had in North Dakota at the time was Verizon. You didn't have AT&T. You couldn't get the iPhone. And so the Android was coming out. I was learning about software. YouTube was popular. I'm on YouTube learning how to build Android software before I even got a phone. And it was like magic what you could do. I mean, I remember yeah. my first tool was uh, an app to count your golf swings, which I'd never even golfed really much, but I knew the idea. So that was my first little demo. And then I jumped into this idea of, well, well I can build my own apps. And so while I'm in college, you know, off, off, you know, not doing well in school, I'm spending time on my computer trying to build some applications and sell them for 99 cents. So I had a bunch of these sort of video game tip apps. Um, I think it called them U-tips um, was that the name of them. And so one was um, Halo, the, uh, the, one of the new Halo video games had come out. And I built this tool that was really good graphics because I stole them all from the Internet, mm -hmm. put them into our tool here. You basically could unlock, you know, half the app by paying a dollar. The other half was free. And you basically learn how to get these different, you know, tips throughout the game to, 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 to progress. And I, of course, got those tips on forums online. It wasn't anything special, but I put into one nice app and you could keep track of what you've accomplished in the game. And I got a ton of progress. Mm -hmm. Actually, eventually we sold, call it $500 to $1,000 worth of these kind of tip apps until we got a cease and desist uh -huh. from Call of Duty uh, makers that said, hey, you can't use our name or our likeness. Uh, your app's going down. And so that kind of killed this momentum of this idea, right? But I was like, man, there's so much opportunity in this space. My brother uh, and I worked on an app for North Dakota State University's um, lunch um, or like the food, the food um, on campus. So okay. there's all this student, you know, free student um, meals throughout, not free, but you're paying for residency and stuff. And so we built an app for that. And we were so successful that all these students had it. Like we had probably four or 5,000 students on this tool. We went to try to meet with the NDSU um, food people. They didn't like we were doing this. They were mad about it. They wanted to build a competing tool. It was terrible. Ours was better. And all the students kept using ours. And long story short, learned all these things along the way, right? But eventually I realized that we wanted to build software. I wanted to build software as a business and found this path, not selling 99 cent apps, but contracting with companies. So we became a professional services business of um, being a consultant, designing, building and deploying apps for businesses. And so we got all kinds of contracts. In the early days, we got a, a, a extension services contract in the egg space. We got um, an app to build, you know, for the best deals in bars downtown Fargo. Um, Fargo Monthly at the time was called. We had all kinds of uh, opportunities, and that's where we started. And for the first five years, 
of that business as I was trying to finish school and, and eventually go full time. I was skipping class and going to business meetings and um, we were getting contracts. And eventually we were growing pretty quickly. We went from like a couple hundred thousand or 50,000 revenue to a couple hundred thousand in revenue to almost a million. But we were burning a ton of cash along the way. We were over budget on all our projects. We weren't getting paid for some of them. Eventually we got stiffed on a hundred thousand dollar bill Oof. that put us in a bad spot. And, you know, I, I graduated a couple years out of graduation, 2013, 2014 rolls around. And <clears throat> we kind of hit a cliff where we were like going to be out of money in the fall of 2014. And we had at that point scaled up this idea. I mean, I was basically a, a glorified project manager um, you know, for a long time, as I was supposedly the CEO, Ryan's running around doing deals. Ryan Raguse, my co-founder, he's out running, doing deals, and we're making this all happen, but we're just, we're actually losing money, but we didn't really realize it. Um, but we were growing. So we're like, well, who cares? We'll be fine. And then we ran out of our line of credit from the bank. We burned through a loan, and uh, pretty soon we're in a tough spot, and we had to call on a local investor who happened to own the building we were in, heard about us and we kind of gave them the pitch of, Hey, would you consider investing in the company? You know, we think we have a lot of growth opportunity ahead, but we, we don't have enough cash to do this. Right. Um, and, uh, he made a small investment at the time. That's I think someday going to pay off pretty well. Cause it became you know, a little later on, we became bushel at the time. The investment was not to be in this idea of bushel. It was really a pro services business. And so mm-hmm. that's the kind of little bit of the background of where we came from. And like we built, seven, 800 different applications over those years wow. from 2011 to 2017, call it, before we really got on to this idea around a, a software as a service model in the ag. So that's kind of the, the short story. And so what did you learn out of that? I mean, if you had to go back and see it, like, um, I guess one of the things I would say that drawing from that was just an intellectual curiosity, right? You talk about kind of a bunch of things coming together um, from, you know, the iPhone or the Android, the ability to build applications, the ability to sell applications and make money. But I think you have just a general uh, inquisitiveness and le- willing to learn that basically led you down some of these paths. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think, you know, my natural tendency is to ask a lot of questions in school and class. And I'm always interested in how things work. And that's kind of how I ended up like, being early. I mean, I remember people telling me, why are you working on Android? You know, or, you know, it's like, well, cause it's the future, like yeah. obviously, uh, <laughs> and, and people just didn't get it. And it's like, why are you building an app company? That seems dumb. And I mean, I remember students, friends of mine that we go to the computer lab and I'm doing homework and they're like, why are you wasting your time? You know, trying to build an app company, you know, you should be getting a, you know, getting your degree and get a, get a job. You know, my mom asked me when I graduated in 2012 in the fall there in December, as I was graduating, she said, so are you going to update your resume and, uh, you know, apply for some jobs? I said, mom, we have 20, 20 people working <laughs> for this business. This is my plan. I now. have a yeah, job. Not the same as my friends are going to make, but eventually maybe it'll work. And so, yeah. you know, it's uh, that, that part of the story is just kind of crazy, right? And you're just, I mean, I was, I remember going into the office. It was at the NDSU Technology Incubator in the basement. We had no windows. I'd go in the office in the morning, like I'd ride the bus there or I'd take, I'd drive. And by the time I leave, it was dark again. So I never mm-hmm. even saw the sun like in the day. And it's like, what, what, this is what am I doing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm like trying to get homework done. And like, it's just an absolute mess. And then another part of the story, the long story short is we had a, a few partners in the early days that um, a couple of professors and, uh, and the friend of Ryan's that, you know, ended up not working out, but we couldn't, just start another business because we had non-competes. And so we had to borrow money from my mom, Ryan's dad, and our own company to buy out these partners in the early days. We just wow. didn't have the money to do it, but we did it anyways. And so, you know, it's paid off probably many times since, but that was a hairy oh, situation bet. as well. You, have, you know, you have to have good alignment with your co-founders and yeah. Ryan and I have always worked well. We've been 12, 12 years in business together, but those other guys didn't work and we just, Thankfully, we were smart enough back then to, or lucky enough to get them out of the way and moving on. Okay, well, good. Let's let's maybe pivot a little bit to. Um, so now you have a services business that's generating, you know, definitely some business, whether it's you know uh, free cash for you or not. Uh, but how did you kind of f- stumble into kind of the bushel opportunity uh, running the services company? Was it like a, a specific project or a set of you know discovery opportunities that you looked at that basically kind of helped you pivot into this? Yeah, so once we got this cash injection from this investor at, you know, 
a few million dollar valuation, call it, um, at the time. And the business was maybe two million in revenue, um, growing pretty good clip. Um, we we started to get back to cash flow positive where we weren't broke in 2015 and 2016. Uh, we weren't losing money anymore, but certainly nobody was making any cash. We weren't paying dividends. We paid ourselves a little bit better salary maybe at that time. But I mean, remember when you do this stuff, you either get paid nothing or eventually I got paid. It was like thousand dollars a month in the early days. And then it was like 30 grand a year of salary. That was a really big jump. Yeah. Um, and then it was like 40 and 42 and 45. I mean, it's, my friends are making 60 and 70 grand out of college and I'm not. Yeah. And yeah. so <laughs> that was some craziness. Of course, I'm getting excited. I was going to get married then. So it was just a bunch of craziness. But as we're getting into the 2015, 2016 years, we've been working a lot um, with some, some uh, sugar beet co-ops up here as well as some other egg companies. And every time we got an agriculture opportunity, we, we would win the deal. We would be the most sort of expert in what they were talking about. We, we came from farming backgrounds or our, our, our friends on the team were um, from backgrounds in agriculture. And so we just knew the industry and we won a lot of those deals. And we looked at our profile of customers we're like, wow, there's like a whole bunch of egg customers we work with. And then like, there's these, all these other random things. Like, why are we trying to be medical software experts? Why are we trying to be good at education software? Like, let's focus. We said, oh, let's focus on five industries. And like, that's not a focus, just so you know. Then it was like, well, maybe we can do three. It's like education, manufacturing, and agriculture. That was the three we picked. And it's like, wow, that's a really broad set of things to do as well. And eventually we realized we should be focusing on one. And that was the same moment in time where Ryan Raguse, my co-founder, started proposing this idea, which became Bushel, which is, hey, we're doing this kind of scale ticket tool for the sugar beet co-op locally here. And, like, they got a ton of farmers using it. And eventually they mandated the tool as part of, like, the requirements to do business with their co-op. And we're like, man, that's cool. But sugar beets is a $10 billion industry, maybe 12. In the, in the grain industry, it's $250 billion you know, situation in the U S and Canada. And so we're like, if we could build software for that group, that would be compelling. And Oh, by the way, Arthur companies down the road is willing to take a bet with us on a tool they're looking for that. We think we can, you know, we, we had this concept for them. We put together in a pitch and they said, we'll do it. So we did kind of an upfront implementation. Uh, what we didn't know is how hard it was going to be to integrate with business systems at these co-ops and, and, and retailers and such. But we did it at first. And we this big heavy lift took like nine months to get all the stuff pulled out of the system to work. And then we built this app. And the app was super simple and they got farmers to use it. And that was the beginning of what became the Bushel SaaS product. But we had no idea in 2016 when we pitched it, when we went out selling it in 2017, how many different systems we would have to learn how to integrate with. We spent millions and millions and millions of dollars now learning how to integrate with these ERP systems that we would have never probably even started on this journey if we would have known yeah. that at the time. It would have been like, well, that's ridiculous. Why would we want to do that? We'll never make money. And uh, that turns out to be our unfair competitive advantage yeah. today yeah. is we're, we're, we're good at the, the integration component, which means we can work with just about everybody. And so that was an advantage. So 2017 rolls around and, I went out with this, the pitch deck we invented. It wasn't even called Bushel yet. It was called M Agri, like mobile agriculture. Well, great name. That was our first pitch. And I raised um, from the False Angels and some others, um, what I would call the Egg Mafia of Fargo. Uh, we raised, originally we were going to raise 750000 We ended up raising a million and a half in funding wow. for the business. And um, the good news about having a services business is you've got a baseline of revenue and you have a baseline of proof that you know how to do something that yep. can make money. Yep. And so you're not getting like a zero value on your experience. You're getting some appreciation there. And then we were, we had already sold our first half million of, you know, recurring revenue or something like that. Um, just, just um, in that first year. And so, uh, you know, raised capital, great investors from the local area, kind of more of an angel round, I would call it. And then uh, went from there. And so, it's a long story from here to there too, but um, uh, yeah, it's, that's how we kind of got got rolling. 
What about, um, is there, was there any challenges between, you know, like I have seen, I think your story is unique from the standpoint of, you don't see that many services companies pivot into product. Um, if you yeah. look at, you know, I mean, if you want to look at like Accenture and Deloitte and all these guys, they, they are great at services, but like they don't have a great software track record. Um, and I've worked with a couple of consulting companies that have basically done very, very well in their domain expertise, um, doing hourly work, but then pivoting that to a product, they've just struggled. The mentality is different, right? You're, you're basically billing hours versus I'm trying to save you hours for a product. I'm curious if you had any of those problems or any of those challenges as you kind of pivoted from, um, you know, kind of doing kind of one time rev type work to offering an offering that was more of a service that was just a monthly offering. Every investor that I met at the time in 2018 and 2019, when we tried to put together our kind of our a round, you might call it um, Silicon Valley, especially just, Poo pooed our services revenue, and like half of them that heard that we even had service revenue at all just said they're not interested on the sole reason that we have any services at all. Um, and most of the ones that passed told us we were going to fail at the transition to a product company, um, that you can't do that or it's impossible. Um, I would say they're, they're mostly wrong, but they, they, there's some truth to how hard it is to get a product focus while relying on one-time revenues. But if at least we prove that if you focus on it, you hone in on agriculture, and eventually we honed in on doing service work for companies who are directly correlated to our market uh, for the product or, or very close to it. So think about like a feed yard and a grain elevator. While they're very um, uh, reliant on each other, so we've done some feed yard work here, but the bushel pox sits here, and there's actually a connection now between the two. Um, and so it's, we did it, but it is, it is still hard to manage that part of the business. Well, like to do that well, while not overlooking the fact that your main growth and your main revenue is coming from, from product. Now, what you want to end up, even any great SaaS company that has a B2B model where you're selling to businesses has like a 10 to 20% services model. Yep. Well, at the time when we started, we were like majority services. Today, we're minority services. Our goal is to get around 20% of our revenue to be services and the rest of the 80% to be recurring or transaction models. And so we're getting closer and closer to that um, as we go. Our pro services model, at one point we had 2017 through 2020, it was like 3 million, 4 million, 5 million, 6 million, I think almost 7 million in revenue on the services side. Um, and COVID hit. In the year of COVID, we had budgeted for potentially 10 million of pro services work. And we did six. Oof. Um, and basically in June of that year, or even in earlier May uh, of 2020, it just dropped like a like a rock, like we just went off a cliff on projects. And um, that was pretty scary. Uh, cause a lot of what you rely on services is you rely on the cash flow or at least a decent margin, margin. of yeah. money. Otherwise, why are you doing it? And so that changed a lot of things for us. We were lucky enough in that time frame. we would have had to lay off probably, you know, 20 to 30 people, maybe 40 even in that moment. Um, but we were able to get some of this, uh, we got two things that happened. We got a, a, a loan from North Dakota that was good timing. And then we got a, uh, we got some of this, um, COVID money, what was it called? I forget the PP. name of the program. Yeah. 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 So we got a significant chunk of cash towards the end of that year that was really meaningful um, to us not having to let people go. And so, and, and, you know, they say, oh, people took advantage of this. Like, we didn't have work for those people. They would not have been employed for not this program. Now, we put them on product work to, like, accelerate some of our work there as an opportunity, but they weren't making us money. It was a disaster. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, that was a pretty scary time. So, so maybe Jake, you could just give me a sense of kind of where you're at today. Like how many employees do you have roughly what like revenue growth look like? I mean, kind of year over year, like I don't need anything that you don't feel comfortable with, but I'm just kind of curious the scale of where you're at today and, and putting this in perspective. Yeah, we're about 175 people or something like that. Um, about 75 to 80 people remote. And the other part is North Dakota, um, Minnesota side here, far, kind of right around Fargo Moorhead. Um, and we've been growing, we're, we're still a little under 20 million in revenue. 
um, as a business, but a majority, vast majority of our revenue is recurring model today. We're pretty proud of that. So making progress as you get bigger, you have to and mature the offering. You kind of have to think about where's your growth mechanisms going to come from. We got a good sense now of what our core product go to market can do for revenue growth per year. And the, we know, you know, generally how many customers there are out there. And so we've launched three, four new offerings that kind of are stacked on top of our existing model of things like transactions and payments, trading capabilities, um, and then our, our fintech model we call Bushel Wallets, a big bet that we've had on for the last couple of years, which is to help move money in this space electronically where, where there's very little um, ACH adoption to pay a farmer or to get paid. Or, I mean, if you ever talk to a farmer about paying another farmer for help on the commercial side of, you know, helping them combine or whatever it might be, these B2B payments are not supported by PayPal or, um, you know, Venmo. And these are usually, you know, significant mm-hmm. dollars and credit cards don't work. Mm-hmm. And so we built a capability where we can move up to $5 million in a single transaction in agriculture between two businesses, whether it's the elevator and the farmer or the farmer and their their local service provider or whatever, uh, that's a pretty compelling capability. I think that we are now just kind of bringing to some scale to the market. So that's been a big bet of ours. Well, that's exciting. And, I, and congrats. I mean, that's that's impressive. Um, I guess the question talking a little bit about going from, let's say, a million bucks to, you know, uh, five million, five million to 10, 10 to, you know, almost 20. Those There's some scaling functions in there. And I, I'm curious about just how your uh, your executive team had to be remade, your processes and your back office have to be remade, um, just the scale, right? I mean, and I, even like culture, right? Just hiring the right people. Um, I think there's a whole bunch of things that are embedded in that that is not simple. Um, and I think a lot of times people overlook just the challenges of doing that. At Concur, we went from like 7 million bucks when I started to like 1.7 billion when I left. And so like every year it was just like a head turner, right? Like there was so many things that had to change to continue to do that and scale. But I'm curious through your business, what are some of the key yeah. kind of inflection points or or pivot points that you had to do from a scaling perspective? Well, the biggest thing as a CEO is your your job like changes all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, you go from working in the business with the team and running helping run projects to working more on the business to 100 percent of your time focus on putting the right leaders in place to now where I'm at of learning how to coach our leaders as not as much of a doer, but more of a guide to how we got to get to the next next point. Spent a lot of time with customers. Um, I mean, our executive teams, uh, uh, seven people, including myself and my co-founder, a little bigger than the normal team, but we've got co-founders in the executive suite. And then, um, uh, you know, we have, I've had to hire and fire a COO and hire another COO. We've had transitions of our president role under me. We've had all kinds of um, craziness. Our board um, has grown over the years to a group of about seven, uh, but just over half are investor, uh, traditional sort of venture type investors, and the other half are individuals or investors um, at an angel level that are on the board. And so a lot of things change as you go, but one thing that doesn't change is how focused you have to be on having great people and figuring out how to avoid having any C and D players on your team. You've got to always level up and you'll learn as you get to scale. And, you know, 150 is like a big point in a business of people where you're kind of no longer a tribe anymore and stuff starts to break down and communication starts to break down. At one point we were 220 people. That was too many people for where we were at in the business. That's what happens when you, sometimes you raise capital and you kind of put a lot of bets on, but you got to, right size along the way to make sure that you're not going to run out of capital when you need it most. Um, But that process of leveling people up and performance management is something that you got to get good at. Once you break a hundred people, it starts to be really important because the A players that really want to win and do a great job uh, get frustrated. If you've got C players and D players around them who they're constantly picking up their slack and uh, they don't want to work for companies who they've got to pick up, somebody else's, you know, non-performance. And one thing that I think mentality that's important to not forget, if you're building a revenue growth model, a, a growing business, not a not a family or lifestyle business, you have to operate like a team, not a family. And the difference there is a family, you're all committed. You kind of don't get to pick and choose. 
who your family members are, your brother is your brother and your sister is your sister. But in a team, it's based on performance and you're either on the team or you're off the team based on if you're helping win or you're helping lose. And so this team mentality is really important to think about. It's not a family. Um, you're building a high performance engine called a business that's supposed to create an outcome for yourselves and investors and your customers. So, yeah, that's interesting. And I, I totally agree with you. I, I guess um, you, you kind of talked a little bit about your executives team and, and, you know, firing and hiring. I think one of the things I see with startups is uh, hiring some of those kind of key executive people is hard, especially the first couple. And I think most companies make some mistakes. And so I'm curious from your perspective, what were some of the lessons learned of doing it and doing it wrong and then redoing it um, from your perspective that you think you could share? Well, it's pretty important to get executive hires, right? But at the same time, almost every single time we added an executive or especially in the early days of hiring the first, what we would call adult supervision of somebody who came in and actually knew what they were doing in a business that wasn't Ryan or I, we were always late. We should have hired them six months earlier or a year earlier. I should have put our COO in six months earlier or a year earlier. If you have a gut feeling that you need that role, fill it. Don't wait too long to find the right person per se. Try it because you're not going to, you have no idea in the beginning what the right person looks like. So you just got to kind of go with your gut. But if it doesn't work, fire quickly. That's important, right? You can't keep people that aren't going to work. But you'll find that you'll probably get good people early. And they'll step up to the plate and they'll level the business up. You know, people that we would have said was really good then wouldn't be good today yeah. in the same yeah. role, right? Yeah. So that's that's just the stages of the business that you got to be at. Uh, and then your hope along the way, as you as a co-founder, if you're like me or Ryan, is that you can keep leveling up. But the only way, you know, in the end, you're not the expert. I'm the youngest person in our executive suite and in the boardroom every single time. And everybody around me needs to be better than me, or why are they here? Yeah. Um, I'm like the bottom of the totem pole. Everybody else needs to be better. And if we're not better at something than I am, then probably they're not the right person. So let's maybe take it one more tangent on this. Um, like, when did you give up like sales responsibility? Um, you know, where you basically brought in somebody that was full time sales and and maybe made uh, you know, and I don't know, I, I don't have any history of kind of like where you manage sales and and that. And then did you bring somebody in to do that? But like, what would that transition look like? And like, at what break in revenue? I think as co founders or or the founder and as a CEO especially you never relinquish sales responsibility in terms of you being involved and helping make things happen. I'm still, I have three sales calls today with, with big customers. Yep. Um, that's still your involvement, but you also can't hire too early somebody who can lead the charge, but you're not in the early days. You're not looking for a sales manager. You're looking for a sales executive or, or, or somebody who can go build the relationships you need to win the business. So, you know, the problem with sales is that you're wrong like 50% of the time. So that's another one where hiring and firing is really important, particularly the firing, firing part. Um, it takes six to seven months for a salesperson in the SaaS business to ramp up to some reasonable level. And if you're seven months in and they're not delivering on anything, they're the wrong person, move on. And so it's a, it's a tricky deal, but you're going to be wrong about sales more often than anything else. Um, so that one, you just have to keep trying constantly. I mean, we've had multiple sales leaders and multiple sales executives, and only one or two people have ever stuck around past three or four or five years on okay. the sales side of our business. And do you think it's because of just the scale and the job just keeps changing and they get kind of outstripped for the job they're doing? Or like, do you have any hypothesis on that? I think sales is just challenging year over year. You know, you got to bring something new to the table all the time. Yeah. And your network does matter. Who you know or how you get to know them matters. Um, but also I'm seeing a version of our sales team now that is more about hustle and putting the time in and getting calls and getting out to the customer that works. And so, and some of these people aren't egg background salespeople, they're SaaS people learning how to sell in agriculture. And so that's an interesting journey, but um, there's no, I, I just don't think there's any kind of formula or reality for for selling no matter what industry you're in. I mean, it's pretty hard no matter how you think about it, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. 
Um, okay, maybe pivoting a little bit more to um, maybe just raising capital. I don't know, you know, obviously y- you've raised a bunch of capital. You talked a little bit about this earlier in your origin story and raising, you know, some angel investment. Um, you've talked about your board and having some investors in it. Maybe talk to me a little bit about like what that process is like. Um, you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are always interested in saying, when can I raise money? How do I raise money? Um, and then, you know, what are the the pieces that come with it? There's expectations, right? There's a lot more scrutiny um, that comes with it. There's more board oversight. There's more fiscal responsibility. Uh, people want to know what you're doing with their money. There's expectations on growth. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about that journey, because I, I think we all get into entrepreneurship uh, to solve a problem. Uh, but I think it gets a lot more serious when you start taking people's money. Yeah, it does. Um accountability goes up. You no longer get to be the only person with an opinion that, and it always goes your way. Yep. <laughs> um, and once you raise significant capital, once you're raising millions of dollars, we've raised a lot of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, um, almost a hundred million dollars of capital. Um, you, you, your job is to build a financial return for your, your um, investor. Now the good news is the way to do that is to serve the customer really well, because then you can build a real business, right? So there's real alignment there. If you ever get out of alignment where your investors aren't aligned with what your customers need, then you got problems. But, you know, having good investment folks on around around you, you know, for us, a lot of our investors are from the Midwest. There's very little sort of coastal VC investment in our business. And I think that's good because they don't know agriculture super well. And so um, it changes though. Um, in the early days, you got a lot of leeway. And as you get to scale, where you need to get to an inflection point of profitability, it's a different it's a different battle, and a lot of a lot of CEOs can't do the job across all of those phases, and a lot of founders have to find somebody else to to do that, and that's okay too. Um, I've been lucky so far to be leading the company, um, but if there's a day that comes where I can't do the job well enough, then my job is to step out of the way. Um, the way to avoid that is to hire great people so that you can just do the things you're only good at. And everybody else is filling in the gaps for things you're not good at. Um, so, um, what about like just people coming into the business? I mean, do they mostly have a like a finance background? You know, you you, you talk to a lot of venture capital folks. Um, we all talk about wanting to have smart money in our businesses, um, which is meaning just value add. And so, how uh, did that happen all the time? Did you feel like you know some money um, had more benefit to you than others? Um, did they bring operational experience? Did they bring um, you know networks? Like, what type of things beyond the money do uh, a lot of the the financing side of this bring to the table for you? I think investors' reputation goes a long ways. So um, different investors you bring in are going to bring a reputation whether you want it or not. And if you have good reputation, it reflects in people when they talk to you about doing business together. Um, They go, oh, yeah, we trust your investors. Or, hey, looks like you've got a good backing. Like, that's meaningful. Um, It's very rare that a venture, you know, investor is going to bring you customers because if they were – uh, able to do that, they probably wouldn't be in venture, right? Their job is to learn the financial models and think about how to make the right bets, but they're not customer people. They don't know your industry and you are the expert. And so if you think you're taking capital because they're going to help you get more customers, you're doing it for the wrong reason. And I've never seen that really be an outcome that's real. Now, the other hand, for us, we took investment from some strategic egg companies who are customers of bushels who invested. That's a little different where you build a partnership mentality. Your upside is their upside in their investment with you. And if you can manage that well, that can lead to really good success. We have some of the biggest ag companies in the United States as investors of ours. Um, They also are painful to work with sometimes, but they have a good mentality as partners in your business. That's where it's meaningful. But don't ever assume that an angel or an investor is really going to help you solve your business problems. They're investing and betting on you. And if they're not, and they think they're going to come run your business, then you've got also a misalignment there. So, yeah, well, and this kind of leads to maybe the board conversation where you know people put money in your business and they they want some oversight, so they they have a board. Um, I, I guess my personal opinion is I see a lot of entrepreneurs they start off with kind of a mentor kind of group that maybe formalizes into a board, and those are pretty benevolent people that maybe haven't put money in the in the business. They're basically there trying to help them operationally, and then it pivots to more of these professional investors on their board. And what I find with a lot of investors or with a lot of entrepreneurs is they look at this as overhead, right? 
now I've got to put together a board packet. I've got more financials. Um, and so how would you kind of talk about like the development of your board, the evolution, the value of it over time? Because I do think in the history of going from, you know, less than $1 million to where you are today, that's a huge difference in the role that they play. So my general advice to entrepreneurs would be don't have a board until you have to have a board and somebody tells you you must and avoid even that as long as possible and keep it small. That's it. Like the only reason a board exists is to have oversight and control over what decisions are being made. And until that's required because you took enough capital where they need those oversights, don't do it. Advisors are fine having a kind of a, you know, all, all CEOs and founders should have mentors involved and they can serve as kind of a quasi board, but do not, I, I, I talk to so many founders who are like, but when do I need to make a board? It's like, you don't need to make a board. Your board will be made for you when you raise more money someday, if you have to. And uh, that's when you make a board. Um, and then when you make a board, then it's important to try to push for the right people in the room, make sure you have good chemistry you know, we hired an independent chairman that's been really helpful for our business where he's not an investor type. Um, he's a, he's a business guy okay. and he helps run the board. Yeah. Um, that's a big deal. Um, but my general advice is just don't be asking yourself, do I need to make a board? No, somebody's going to tell you someday you need a board and then you'll deal with it. Um, but don't, don't invent overhead in the early days. You don't need do you ever find like I guess I've been on a couple of boards where um, you know I think there there's some value add to it you know everybody brings some different background. Do you really leverage them to bring and say hey these are some of the tough problems that we're dealing with and or give them homework um, as far as like hey you know go help me research a certain area or uh, this option that I could go do whether it's around financing whether it's around uh, market conditions. I, there's a bunch of different things that you have a day to day job to go do and like leveraging your board for more strategic opportunities besides just oversight? Yeah, I think there's, <clears throat> there's been times along our way where that's been helpful. It's not often that you have a lot of homework for the board though, because it's hard to know what, to, what they can really help with. They've got a lot of things going on. Typically they've made a lot of investments, but the best ones are people introductions and talent. So like one of the best things we had was we were doing a CFO search and one of our board members help us identify a good search firm that knows CFOs and technology. And those are the kind of things that you can really leverage yep. um, from your board. But the other one is just industry connections. If they're in the industry, they certainly can make introductions. They're not going to sell your offering for you, but, you know, getting the right connection here or there, or, you know, if you have really good investors, they're pretty influential sometimes in the whole industry. I and mean, we have a few of those on our board where going to their events is really meaningful because they've got other customers in the room and people we could be working with. And so you got to think about that, but we, you know, maybe we should do more homework, but I don't think, I don't know how much homework a board can really do. They just don't, they're not involved in the business enough to really have meaningful direct advice. They're generally helping guide overall, but it's hard for them to get into the, to the details and into the weeds enough to, to make meaningful change there. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Um, so maybe changing topics a little bit, like, you know, you've been an entrepreneur doing this for, I don't know, just back at the cocktail, 14 years. Um, that's a good chunk of time. If you think back to kind of um, entrepreneurship, like when you started versus where you are today, like what would you, what advice would you give to, to folks that are just trying to start out? Right. I think there's a lot of people that um, are trying to figure out whether they have an entrepreneurial attitude. They're intellectually curious. They're playing around with things. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things that keep them from doing that. Right. Once I got a good job, I got benefits. Um, and so it's a risk to go do this. And so what would you tell those folks um, given kind of the path and, and journey you've had? So my opinion is that the younger you are, the better chances you have of figuring it out. And like when I, when I started doing this, when I was in college, I had very little overhead in my life, like very little commitments. I could work till three in the morning if I wanted and skip all the classes in the morning and do like, you can't do that once you get a family and a commitment and a house and all these things that you have these big bills building up and you've got to have an income. It gets harder as you go farther into life to start. Um, so my advice is if you're on the younger end of that scale, go do it now. Don't wait. You're not going to, there's no better time that's coming. That's going to be easier for you to start the business. There's no experience that you haven't got yet. They, those people tell me, Oh, I need more experience before I can go build the business. Like that's then you're either, you're not an entrepreneur or you are just 
you should know that that's not what's required to start a company. There's zero experience required. It's a lot of hustle, a lot of attitude, and a lot of learning. Um, we call it flirting. I call it flirting. It's like failing, but if it's not a failure. If you learn from it and pivot from it and, and get better to follow, you know, failure is, is the thing everybody dreads, but you fail a lot in entrepreneurship, but it's not a true failure if you keep going and you learn from it. And that's where you get this kind of flirting mentality. Like you're going to fail a lot, but you got as long as you're always learning from it, you're going to keep building up those steps of what's possible. And that's just what it takes. I can tell you a thousand things that we failed at. We stopped counting how much money we lost a long time ago. And it was in the millions. Like, it's crazy all the things you learn, but there's no amount of experience that you can get that's just going to help you wake up one day and start the company. Yeah, well, I love the flirting uh, piece of it. I, I always talk about uh, Nelson Mandela has that cool quote that says, I never lost, I either won or I learned. Um, I never failed, right? That's That's been his quote. And so I think that kind of yeah. definitely goes into it. And I think um, as entrepreneurships, I think um, we have a f- like a fear of failure. I think as a culture. And so I think we don't really celebrate that nearly as much as we should. Um, and so yep. I think, you know, that, that's part of it. And so I, I think your message here is, you know, learnings plus failure is, is really important because if you, you know, you, you can look at some things on paper that didn't look good, but if you learn something from it and continue to move forward and got better, man, life gets, I, that's, that's the journey. Yeah, no, spot on. It's just, yeah, you're, you're, there's nothing you're waiting for right now that's going to change, that's going to make it make sense to one day jump up and do it. So, yeah, well, good. It. Um, maybe, like, maybe taking this a little bit further, what would you tell your 20 year old self? What could you do if you went back to, like, you know, basically, you know, where you were and where you started in college and did all this stuff? What are some of the learnings? Are there two or three things that you would say, man, if I had known this today when I first started, um, I would have, you know, stubbed my toe a lot less along the way? I think the main learning I had was after I, you know, I had a lot of variety of customer types and stuff we were working with and trying to learn how to build all these different things. But once you know what you really like or what you want to do, you need to cut all the other stuff in focus. Focus. If we would have focused on agriculture two years earlier, we would have been two years ahead of where we are right now, maybe more. Um, and so that focus took us a long time to go, okay, it's time to just commit to one area. You are way better off being the world's greatest expert in a smaller component of an industry than being an average or below average expert in 50 uh, or five or even three. And so um, my best learning would be my advice to myself would have been once I realized agriculture was something we could meaningfully be better at, then I would have focused on that earlier and just dropped all the excuses as to why we got to keep the market big enough. The market's not big enough. It's it's. Most of the time, if you focus and you're the best in it, uh, it can be big enough to build a real business. So, yeah, I think that's a really good one, and I think you see this quite a bit where people are, you know, worried about TAM, and so they're, you know, total addressable market. So they're basically trying to find stuff, or they're trying to, you know, aggregate a bunch of different businesses together or you know industries together. So I think focus is good, and then just going deep, like you said, um, you know, it's going to take hard work. It's going to take a lot of learning. Uh, but the, if you became the expert in that, then there's usually opportunities for you to be successful if you can execute. And I think that's a big part of all of these startup ideas, right? It, it, the, the right answer yeah. and the right idea is not the that's not how you win, you win by executing on that plan. And so um, I think that it, that's a good kind of lesson learned. Um, what do you think about like just the the future trends and kind of ag tech in general? I mean, you you kind of alluded to this in the very beginning where you were talking about it's not the, the farmer who's really the issue. There's a lot of technology advancement there. We talk about precision ag. We talk about drones. We talk about there's just a lot of innovation that's happening in this. Do you think that um, kind of this trend continues? Do you think that it it it, it it just continues to scale. Um, how, how do you, you know, there's things like AI that are coming down the pipe that will probably get adopted in a lot of these in different industries. How do you think about the future of ag tech? Well, it's agriculture is one of the most cyclical types of businesses to be in. And so I think the next few years in ag are going to be a tricky one for, you know, just the farm economy is going to be on a downward trend. Probably is the prediction most people have commodity prices are coming down. Um, so the next few years is going to shake out, you know, the companies who are here to stay and who aren't. Um, I've already seen a lot of companies burn out in the last 12 months during this sort of software um, boom where, or software um, sort of pullback where companies aren't investing. Um, so 
it's an interesting environment. We don't need more satellite imagery companies. We don't need more, you know, drone flyers. We have like real problems need to be solved. There's a ton of problems in agriculture that do need to be solved. And a lot of it has to do with scale and manpower and just not having enough humans to do the job anymore. We've got, you know, basically one and a half to 1% of the population now feeding majority of everybody like that keeps going down. And so we need more mechanization. We need better robotics. We don't need more fancy imagery companies. We don't need more, uh, just do this thing, but 10% better. We need like 50 and hundred percent increases in capability, you know, removing a person from a tractor is a big step. Um, so the tractor does the job without the person. Those are the things that are meaningful in the future. And the other part is software is just way behind an egg. And so there's a lot of infrastructure around software that needs to be built still that I think we're, we're working on at Bushels. So that's what's coming up in the future, I think. So do you think there's still plenty of opportunity for entrepreneurs in this space? I mean, you, you know, you talk about robotics. That's a pretty complex one. Um, you know, software, you think there's a lot of open, uh, wide, you know, white spaces for people to continue to innovate? Yes, but but the soft, the um, the software opportunity is more simple than people try to make it. There's just simple problems that need to be solved still in ag. You don't have to be complex and fancy and 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 um, overbuild things to be meaningful in agriculture. And simple is better. And um, because it's the last industry to be significantly digitized, it means there's way more opportunity than there is in say a more advanced industry. And so the barrier to entry is low, but work on meaningful stuff. Make sure it's a problem a farmer cares about or a facility cares about or whatever. But the next farmer app to help them market their grain a little bit better is not the answer people are looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Well, hey, we, we've taken 55 minutes. I got my last question for you, um, which is really, what's the kindest thing that anybody's done for you? Um, you know, we didn't, you know, we all ended up in a different spot. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of people that helped us get here. And so I always think this is a great way to kind of close these things out. So I'm curious from your perspective, uh, Jake, what is the, the kindest things that anybody's ever done for you? Hmm. That's an interesting question. So I mean, I've had a few friends along the way in business that have loaned me money or helped me get through really tough times where we just didn't have, I just didn't have the money to pay for the bills and they just, no questions asked. Here's some money. I had a friend who gave the company a loan uh, in a moment when we needed it. Um, uh, that From a business standpoint, those are some pretty meaningful things because if that didn't happen, I don't know where we would have been. We probably wouldn't have made it. And so there's people out there that want people to succeed and want want people to make progress and be helpful. And uh, I've met some of those people in Fargo along the way that have been huge to our success. Well, that's cool. Uh, it takes a takes a lot of folks and a lot of mentorship and a lot of people to have faith uh, to get you where you are. And so that's that's a cool story. So, well, Jake, I really appreciate yeah. you taking the time. I, I think there's a lot of cool nuggets in here um, for somebody that's interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, your journey is is compelling and it's inspiring. Um, and I just really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank 